<laughs> Go through all the numerous stuff. Okay. I wonder how that sounds. <laughs> Just trim that off the beginning of the video. Me. Do we have anyone in the in this room over there? no, I'm gonna check with this. Yes. yes. Uh, if not, we actually don't have any agenda items. Yeah, I thought they was If we want to, we can pick up ad hoc items. Mm -hmm. um, if not, uh, we can uh, once we go to the hall. Uh, <laughs> it might be too early. Yeah, it's it's a bit too early. Uh, uh, so the first day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The last day was fun as a nice description. Yeah. <laughs> With the jet lag, I still uh, going to sleep quite early, so I'm waking up six a.m. in the no. morning. I, I got up at four, and it's like horrible. It's just <laughs> really destroyed. And also, I, I really have an issue with the air conditioning because my throat is like I don't know. It's yeah. super, super weird. I'm not used to it. All right, hey everybody. Uh, this is a uh, next edition of uh, WASM <laughs> Working Group for the Tag Runtime. We are a CNCF community. Um, which means uh, we abide by the code of conduct and uh, we uh, are generally trying to be kind to each other and inclusive in our conversations. So um, as that, uh, we actually do not have any agenda items, but uh, we were here today in person, so it would be really great to get together. Um, so uh, without any agenda items, do we have any questions, comments, concerns, PSAs? Ooh, hey. hi. Hello, Dan. Yeah. So I think maybe one thing that we can comment today is that since we are here at WASANCOM, which is one of the first events from the CNCF related to WebAssembly, we can ask you the question about what's the what's the, the talk or topic that you enjoyed the most uh, during the first day of the conference? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, anybody? Yeah, I think a very impressive one is that there are multiple talks in terms of bringing like the web assembly more closer to the to the operating system and like even uh, assessing how we could use web assembly uh, as an integral part of the operating system. And uh, actually, I was quite surprised to not seeing only one talk, but I can think there are at least two or three talks that are uh, touching this, this touching this t uh, topic. Um, one of them is from from Ralph, I guess this is today actually, right? Yeah. So he's going to uh, talk about like integrating um, you know, WebAssembly runtimes with, uh, I guess, the use of the flat car Linux. Mm -hmm. um, and there was another talk yesterday by um, uh, by, by uh, Dan about uh, Wazi OS. Um, Dan Goldman? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, which was super exciting. And also, I think it's um, uh, it sheds light and like about the direction where we are where we're heading to. So. Yeah, that, that talk, I, I was I was expecting something a little bit different from the talk. So when I saw WASI OS, I was thinking, okay, maybe this is a uh, the, the the cool to say we're not we're not going to be positive. It's like we're going to actually, hey, this is this is the OS interface, and it was it was more about uh, you know the principles of what we're building or what WASI is is uh, building. And uh, I thought the name stood out even more. Uh, so yeah. when you think about uh, WebAssembly Systems Interface OS, it didn't quite roll off the tongue quite as well. Uh, I kind of <laughs> thought about like it, when Luke brought up maybe WASI as a systems interface doesn't really isn't really the definition. It's more the uh, the acronym should be like WASI uh, uh, standard interface. Uh, and, and that kind of rang true to me for WASI standard interface OS. 
Uh, because, you know, at that point, okay, we can talk about all of these interfaces as the base of this, this new level that you're building upon as opposed to, uh, you know, the 40-year-old, 50-year-old uh, POSIX interface. Um, I don't know. I, I was, I, it was more about uh, how you communicate between components as much as, like, you know, Unix piping. Like, okay, I get it. That's cool. Um, is that an OS? True, but on the other hand side, I think that that basically um, sets the stage for for a paradigm that, that uh, how you author your applications and uh, utilize the component model. So I think it's important to have this kind of talks to yeah, this, like set the stage and to to uh, raise the expectations. But... Yeah, there was another architecture talk with the component model yesterday uh, from Stuart Harris about iOS and Android apps and how to utilize that component model to keep your your app code uh, in like he called them pure components mm -hmm. and then uh, the run uh, the other platforms you're supporting whether it's iOS or Android or or whatever else can render the output from that pure model uh, I love those architecture talks. You know, I mean, I think that there's pros and cons to that design as well, but um, giving the basis of the component model to the, uh, to the like people that would be implementing it so that they can start the right way and, and understand the patterns and how to use them. Yeah. I think it's, it's, it's super good. cool to have this kind of talks because like uh, we, we shift the WebAssembly from, from the browser to the server side. Now that we are also talking mm -hmm. about WebAssembly, having it on the mo our mobile phones, I think this, um, there's some beauty of it that shows like the flexibility mm -hmm. of the technology and um, what to expect in the future. Yeah, I think one thing that I'm excited for about that is that having the components in that way gives you the ability to you have one component that needs a uh, certain kind of APIs, certain kind of interfaces, and you can satisfy those in different ways depending on the environment. So for example, you can take the same component, put it in a server and accessing system resources, but then you can take the same component and create your own stack or kind of mock server from the browser just because you don't have those resources there. And that's just plugging in different elements together. But the main application that you have is still the same. So I think this is this is really nice because in the past having the uh, I was working um, in the past with kind of full stack. So at the time that you need to to do fronting stuff or backing stuff, there are completely different skills. But it seems that with WebAssembly you will reach that point in which there is no such a difference between between the two different environments. And I think that's that's really cool um, to see. Yeah, platform virtualization. Yeah, <laughs> and you even showcased this yesterday in in, uh, in your talk, right? About, yeah. about Wasi and then so you were executing it like on your MacBook, but also uh, using exactly the same um, WebAssembly binary and yeah. uh, put it in the browser and executed it there. So. Yeah, that was that was fun because it took me. Uh, it was related to the getting started with AI uh, and WebAssembly talk, and one of the demos that we did was based on a project that is called uh, Lama to C which is basically a um, project created by Andre Carpathy. And it's a, it, it created, I mean, for me, it's like, whoa, just one single C file of 700 lines. It's can run inferencing Lama 2 models. And mm -hmm. it's just a single file. Just for learning purposes, it's amazing because you can see all the different layers, how they interact together. Super cool. But having that C file, it's kind of trivial to say, why not compiling it to WASI? So you compile them to WebAssembly, WASI, and then you have the same model, exactly the same that you can put it. I, I tried three different devices that I had at home. So basically the browser, my Mac OS, and also a RIS5 board. And it was like in one hour, I could make work in all of them at the same time. That's nice. That's, that's yeah. really cool. Yeah, that would have been pretty tough to compile each target and handle yeah. all the artifacts uh, as opposed to just a single uh, WebAssembly artifact. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that was really cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, by the way, one thing that just to comment really that I saw that someone joins. Oh, hi. Hey. hi. Hello. Hi. How are you? <laughs> so, so yeah, just just want something to comment regarding the talks that we are that we are talking about. All of them are recorded. Um, they were streamed. So, as if you as me missed some of the talks because you cannot be in two rooms at the same time, <laughs> you can check later on YouTube. 
Uh, are they uploaded on, on YouTube or something? Yeah, I think they're on YouTube. I don't know if they are already in YouTube, uh, but uh, I think they were even live stream. Yeah, yeah, they have live stream. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I think they were live streaming the YouTube and. I think automatically. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so they 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 should be available. Um, you know what? Uh, part of this, I'll I'll add a link to help folks find them. Um, to the uh to the meeting notes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, it, what talk stood out to you, Dan? Uh, it was mainly that one that I was talking yeah. about the um. Mm -hmm. Uh, using the component model for mobile uh, app development and how to break, uh, you know, organize your your code so that, um, that I mean, primarily it, it saves you in testing uh, because you have this all of your logic that's easily testable without having to um, worry about the rendering pieces that would happen yeah. afterwards. Um, and I, I I just thought it was super cool the way he organized it like that. Very useful for folks in, in the mobile space. I, I particularly, I, I liked uh, the conversation where we started talking about a repository of libraries that uh, are language independent. Like you can use them from any language, right? So um, <laughs> uh, my background at Microsoft uh, was uh, building SDKs uh, and automating the process for describing our APIs and then driving the production of the SDKs and then uh, documentation from those. Uh, when I first went to Microsoft, we uh, we, <laughs> we had a process that uh, uh, was very manual. Um, and most of our services didn't describe themselves in open API specifications. So we ended up moving everybody over to open API specifications. Um, and then we had code generators to generate out every language. And I think almost every cloud does this, right? Yep. Um, so you got Smithy over in AWS. Uh, we end up using uh, OpenAPI uh, and we host all those specs in GitHub. Uh, but that is a ton of work to go and produce every single language and try to make it idiomatic for every language user. Yep. Um, what if we could compile those to WebAssembly and you could use those from any language? Uh, we don't have to write a code generator for Zig, perhaps, or you know whatever that new language is. You are already bootstrapped with this this ability to use WebAssembly to um, you know access whatever resources you really need to. Yeah. Um, I from when you look at a large organization or even a small organization that's trying to reach out to a wide variety of customers, mm -hmm. uh, this, this, is a, this is a huge game changer. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the amount of effort uh, and cost that goes into producing, uh, you know, really nice uh, developer experience uh, is, is, it's expensive. Yeah, um, absolutely. And there, I think there are a lot of libraries where um, um where this kind of model would shine, which would be like, for instance, crypto crypto li uh, libraries, because you you actually don't want to have a JavaScript library and a PHP library. You want to have the best of breed crypto library. Yes. And having something like a I don't know, let's call it component hub, similar to Docker hub, where um the the best libraries are curated in a way or even voted, and um like all the applications are basically relying on the crypto library or I don't know the HTTP server implementation. Um, I think this would be like a game changer for the entire industry um, that, that would, um, to to have this kind of opportunity. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm curious to see how, because this is a conversation that I, um, that I was a part of multiple times over the time uh, since I was working with Assembly. Um, one of the questions that always came to my mind is that I see the point of having those library just compiled once, because in the end, what yeah. happens from that, mm -hmm. at least what I see in different languages, is that you have the concept of native extensions. When you are working through with Python, this kind of library. So in the end, you are sharing the same C code. Mm -hmm. Basically, you have to have a build process when you are installing third-time gems of libraries oh, yeah. all the time. Um, sometimes With it's that, really, uh, really painful. Yeah, I, I'm thinking about <laughs> not forgetting. Yeah, yeah. Yes. which is really, really painful. But at the same time, those are the ecosystem that developers are used to work with. Yeah. So anytime that you go to, to Ruby, you do game install, or you go to Python, you do pip3. And right. I think that's also a lot of work to put all those libraries together and put like, yeah, you have the, the WebAssembly unique implementation, but at the same time, you put an interface on top of that. A little and wrapper you, around exactly, that, right? Exactly. So I'm not sure if that in the future, we will have something that even simplifies how you create that wrapper. 
and yes, it's integrated. I think that will be that will be cool, but so they can still use it in an idiomatic way, yeah, and exactly. not have to like have the special exactly, WebAssembly then... import. Exactly, but not having to deal with, I'm thinking from the point of view, for example, if I create a library that I want to distribute into different kind of ecosystem, um, I still, I can compile just once, but I will need to maintain those wrappers and at the same time have different actions to deploy it to the different ecosystems. Yeah. Um, you know, it could be an issue with versioning because the wrapper with Python, now I need a different version because I miss one specific function. Now I have different versions between the others. So I'm thinking uh, that solving that issue I don't have any response for that or any idea, but that would be really helpful. What, what, what the, what's about, what's special about WebAssembly enabling that? Why uh, why can't we do the same thing on native code? I mean, it mm -hmm. seems like what the component model is doing is uh, specifying an ABI for things to, to talk. And that's not specific to WebAssembly, right? I, I, it's It's been developed in the context of WebAssembly, so, so but, what what's stopping us from doing that natively? That's a really great question. And and just a meta question real quick. Uh, Jorge, can you hear us all right? Yes, perfect. Fantastic, <laughs> okay. Um, so that's actually something that I had worked on previously uh, so that we could use, uh, you know, native uh, binaries uh, and share them across uh, languages. And you can do it. Uh, th there's nothing like really stopping you because, I mean, if you look at a lot of the uh, Python uh, uh, packages, it's, it's mostly native code underneath anyway, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah. the, the Python, uh, wrapper over top, like say like NumPy or something like that, um, everything is done, uh, numerically underneath in, in C code. Um, the, the differing factor here, I think is the architecture independence. So yeah. when you, when you pull down like uh, Noko Gary, or you pull down some other thing with native, uh, uh, dependencies, you either need to pre-build for each architecture that you're targeting, or you need to have the build tools available on the machine to compile the native uh, implementation on that specific OS architecture combination. Um, the nice part, in my opinion, would be not having to worry about uh, compilation or build uh, tools on the given machine and not worry about the architecture or OS dependencies that may or may not be there. Okay, so yeah, yeah we, we, then we're talking the, the selling point uh, or what makes it special using WebAssembly is that we are not tied to a particular CPU architecture. Yeah, um, the, the one other uh, aspect of that is uh, the errors that you get back when something fails within the native side versus uh, something that fails within the Python or Ruby or you know whatever uh, you know host is wrapping it. Uh, those error messages usually look really nasty. Like uh, totally not from the the language. It's like uh, error messages from another um, universe. But the comp WebAssembly or component model are not going to help with that, are they? I don't know that they will, but they will uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure if it will. Um, I mean, m maybe like if if we use, like if a library chooses to return a variant that uh, like a, a Rust result, you know, that's an okay or error, then they can interpret in that way. But then uh, you could do the same with a, a C ABI. Mm. Yeah. I think one, one of the things that, that for me, it's also a game changer and I keep thinking more and more over the time now that I have WebAssembly in mind, I found this pattern in many different uh, ecosystem or, or tooling or applications. And it's that we are constantly downloading arbitrary binaries from internet. So the time that we, for example, do a, a C um, native extension, we are trusting the actual uh, code that we are pulling if we are doing a pre-built binary. And if we need to build the, the C extension or the extension natively, we are trusting that process of building, but that process of building in some ecosystem, they are even just running bash scripts, for example, and a bash script can access anything that you give power to because you are using the same user. Yeah, yeah. Like, so for I, me, having, having the ability to get that WebAssembly binary, um, making sure that it will, yes, for example, if, if we are talking about libxml, 
you don't need to give access to the resources in the system. You don't need to file a system. You just need to pass one uh, one um, input and then return the the stroke or, or whatever you want to get from that from that library. And I think that for me that's a really good point of using WebAssembly. Yeah. I, really I I think I think that's a great selling point that the the sandboxing and security you get out of the box. I think there was something um, by Mozilla. They 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 were they wanted their process. The, the 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 Firefox process to be uh, shielded from uh, either malicious code or buggy code in I think in, in a third party library and I think they, they were doing this for a font rendering library or something like that so they were compiling the library to WebAssembly and then uh, using Watson to C to generate C code for that WebAssembly library mm -hmm. uh, so it's like transform the the WebAssembly to an equivalent C code. And then they were compiling that C code natively. So they basically had C code that they uh, they were sure was sandboxed. So they, they had a native library that they were sure was sandboxed because it went through the WebAssembly uh, mm -hmm. step. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then like if if the if the library had a bug and it would have crashed the process, uh, it just crashed its sandbox. Mm -hmm. And then if the library wanted to access something that it didn't have access to, uh, it couldn't because it didn't have the import from the real, uh, the real C code. Um, I, I think that there's an, another aspect to your uh, initial question or, or the other way around, there is an extension to your question, like which is okay, now that we agreed on, on WebAssembly, um, why, why do we have the component model and, and, and uh, are there alternative approaches actually? Because there's a, there's a company um, called Lupo Labs and they're currently um, um, yeah, basing their services on, on uh, Vazero, the, the Golang yep. um, runtime for WebAssembly, and it does not uh, implement um, a component model yet. But nevertheless, they are able to um, call from um, Golang compiled WebAssembly um, to, to Rust compiled WebAssembly module by um, basically using, using a, um, a, a GitHub project that they created on their own called Polyglot. And what it basically does, it's like mapping out the, the memory space of the, the Golang side and the Rust side, yeah. and basically reserving the, the uh, memory space to, to, to share the, yeah, the space for the, for the actual structures that you want to uh, interchange. And um, what they did was basically they, um, I mean, the, the, the Golang regex engine is like notoriously slow. It's, it's actually pretty um, uh, popular for being slow. So they actually are using the regex um, form from, from Rust uh, in their Go um, application code. And uh, they have like dramatic performance increase by <laughs> doing so. And I, I think it's super interesting to see what's possible even now, even without the component model. Mm. And um, that this oh. kind of polyglotism or, or yeah, like, like using from a higher level language, a lower level language mm. and the performance uh, um, um, things that, that this is already possible. It's like mind blowing to me. It's, it's yeah. cool. Something I don't understand. What, what's, what's stopping us from like, there's all these efforts into the component model and into with the, the WebAssembly interface types. What's stopping us from saying, uh, we can do that today with Protobuf. We, we just <laughs> define an interface on Protobuf and we can use it from Rust to C or from Rust to Go or whatever, you know? Yeah. Is it like, are we reinventing Protobuf? Uh, so that's that's uh, that's a really good question and something that I you know might might be a good conversation topic for uh, say the component model the, the bytecode alliance component model uh, meetings. Um, I I have thought the same thing. Uh, are we just creating a different ABI? Um, and do we really need uh, because you know part of off you're going to describe your memory layout of structures. And uh, it it's already there. Why why not use that? Um, I mean, I say protobuf for say mentioning one of the many uh, frameworks that are for the same thing. I pack G R P C or whatever. <laughs> well, G G R P C is probably you know that that's more like I P C right, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to just like how something is packed and you know sent over uh, just you know packed and then unpacked right on the other side. Yeah, but uh, we we can you can do that like within the same process. Like the, there's a serialization and deserialization process there as well, right? Yep, yep. Uh, and 
I, I think that's a fair question. Um, I know a lot of work has gone into the canonical ABI uh, and description of types uh, across width boundaries. Um, I don't know. That that's a good one to talk through. Uh, I, I think there's a, I I think that anyway there's a lot of value on trying to redefine uh, the system interface using uh, something like a wheat or protobuf or whatever framework like well, wheat seems to be the canonical one right <laughs> uh, but now we we do have like a file system description that doesn't rely on libc it well mm -hmm. maybe the implementation will use libc but the, uh it that what you use as a developer is something that's using uh an interface so that that i, I find that uh, interesting and valuable Maybe there's metadata that's missing from protobuf that they'd have to mm -hmm. like yeah. mm -hmm. have a more. Uh, I, I'm not I'm not an expert on protobuf. I've never used it, but so sorry if I brought the wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I mean it's, uh, it's good. I I think there is also one thing. It's about the flexibility. What you were mentioning, like um, maybe protobuf is already. So standardizing many different environments that applying any required change on the on that specific uh, language will take more time or it will be could be a blocker right. for increasing that option or adding new features. So I think it it was kind of try to simplify as much as possible something that works for WebAssembly. It's it comes with certain particular things like, for example, in Protobuf, you have or Protobuf and similar ones, you have the, this definition outside. But in WebAssembly, when you compile with the with the component model, you get that definition inside the model and you can extract that information. So I think that on one side, it's it's true that there are different offerings or different uh, tooling that already exist that can be reused. But since WebAssembly is still emerging, the component model is still emerging and there is evolving. It's, I don't know because I'm, I'm not I'm neither an expert on component model, but I think it gives the flexibility to continue improving it without having to deal with breaking changes with other ecosystems that already use those tools. I can't wait till there's no more breaking changes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, only on Only on Web only on solve all the architecture problems yeah. with this new architecture. Yeah. <laughs> there's a relevant XKCD for that. Like, the number of standards. <laughs> yeah, we just need one more standard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I I have to say that I'm really excited about uh, seeing uh, Dapper running side by side with uh, WebAssembly uh, mm -hmm. components. Uh, so uh, one of the cool things that came in recently was uh, what is it? Uh, uh, run Wazzy and. Uh, the, the work there has now uh, used Yuki for uh, being able to load uh, containers in the same pod as uh, WebAssembly modules. Um, what do we what do we think about that? I, I think it's it's awesome because it's like opening a lot of use cases because it's not only Dapper which is which is enabled by this but like basically any kind of sidecar pattern, right? Yeah. So you could uh, integrate uh, your WebAssembly modules with your service meshes. Uh, for instance, like like Istio, or you could uh, I don't know um, have, have other patterns where you like fetch data from your key value store and inject it into your container or into your into your WebAssembly module. So um, I think there uh, it's just just like streamlining the experience that you already are used with your Kubernetes and your your actual pod handling uh, to to this kind of new world. Mm. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. I had no idea it was possible until I talked to you this morning. <laughs> uh, like, especially from a migration perspective as well. Yeah. You have all of these, like maybe hundreds, thousands yeah. of different microservices. And, oh, I want to start by migrating one to, mm. <laughs> to this quasi and yeah. component model, but it still needs to interact with the rest. Well, mm. you don't always want to do that at the network layer. Uh, sometimes yeah. you want to be a part of the same uh, pop. But, but to be fair, given the fact that this is possible, like since I don't know a week, maybe or a couple of weeks, <laughs> so I guess you're still one of the first guys who <laughs> noticed this. So I, I don't think that you're late. <laughs> okay, all right, all right. I was blown away when the when the release came out. Uh, Keith Maddox uh, ended up uh, 
posting a, a tweet where he had he had taken uh, Istio and uh, you know he was showing a, a dashboard of the app layout between uh, a service mesh uh, service mesh uh, as well as uh, uh, some WebAssembly apps uh, and it's just showing up in Istio and it's like oh how cool is that uh, and, and then I think I think it was like a day after the release and. Uh, that it's really inspiring to see uh, folks like pick it up, start playing with it, mm. and uh, mm. you know, see what problems it solves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That gives oh. the opportunity uh, to think that WebAssembly could be a possible way uh, to implement things. So I, I'm not, I'm not uh, familiar with Kubernetes, but why, why is a pod tied to one runtime? Why can't Oh, a pod yeah. run an image that has many <laughs> runtimes. I mean, this is a great sounds, question. Um, I feel like what we did of adding the running uh, Linux containers and we using Yuki on on Wasi, it's like a workaround to a Kubernetes limitation more than than adding a real feature to run Wasi. <laughs> uh, so, uh, as the alternative, uh, would you say uh, I should probably use like Run C or uh, you know? I, so I, 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 again, I don't, I don't, I'm not familiar with Kubernetes. But why can't Kubernetes? Why can't we specify the runtime that we want an image to use, and, and then that, Kubernetes, the, the pod runs itself, yeah. uh, is created in the runtime, which defines the network layer. So you'd have to have some way of having a pod sandbox that defines that network layer. Um, bridge the gap between runtimes. Yeah. Right now it, it lives in the runtime, right? I mean, ba basically every pod defines like a, a network namespace on, on Linux level. So uh, only like a process that are part of this network namespace are able to talk to the same network namespace. And uh, given the fact that uh, WebAssembly is kind of isolated, it's not part of this, of this namespace. And I assume this is, this is like part of the, the reason why we need them. I mean, we, we, could, we could end up having I mean, you could imagine a, a where you have each image within a pod has a, all right, so from a Kubernetes level, uh, when you describe a pod, a pod has a runtime class on it. Uh, that runtime class, uh, then uh, the runtime class name then ties to a Kubernetes structure called a runtime class. That runtime class describes uh, a few things. Um, one, it describes uh, the name of the handler in container D that ends up handling the workload. Uh, and two, it describes to the scheduler uh, where I can send these workloads to run, like what nodes uh, are okay to run okay. these. Can, can that be updated in Kubernetes so that instead of being one runtime, it's like a, a map that has a runtime name uh, well, or a run, uh, a, a give an ID to a, a, a runtime name, and then the pod could run many runtimes. Uh, and you can specify the runtime in the image. I, I think the question is, does, does container D or uh, any of the um, container uh, uh, implementations support being able to have a network layer, mm -hmm. like a network namespace across multiple runtimes? Because that's what you would have to have. Uh, yeah, it does, right? Uh, as far I mean, as I we understand, could, it does. We could do that at the container D level. I that would be a. I mean, we could make that change. In I mean, so uh, then you could move uh, the uh, I, I'm, class I, to the I, container okay. spec. Hmm. Uh, so and from from or have one at the, I don't know. On the Docker Compose side, we we do have examples where you have like native. Uh, native containers running alongside, like you have a native uh, uh, Nginx container uh, with uh, running alongside a WebAssembly container and, and running alongside a, a MariaDB container, which is native. And they're all running inside of the same network. And then you expose the port of the Nginx container outside. So uh, they are sharing the same network namespace and they're isolated from the rest of the machine. So it should be possible, right? Absolutely. I think it's possible. We just have to change the pod definition, the pod spec. Mm -hmm. um, so 
I, I, <laughs> like that's not a that's not a small change, um, but it's definitely one that uh, I think we could propose as a cap and start getting some community feedback on. Yeah. Because I think that would be the right way of doing it. What we are uh -huh. doing on Ranwasi of using some heuristic to decide if it's a WebAssembly container or a native container, and then choosing one of them. Uh, it's kind of like a hack to, it's like a workaround to, for a, a limitation on Kubernetes, right? Right. And you don't necessarily want, uh, you know, Yuki to be running your native containers. Uh, you probably would want your runtime that you are comfortable with. Maybe just, just by virtue of choosing to run a WebAssembly module within a pod, you shouldn't have to default to using Yuki's uh, native uh, container uh, runtime. Yeah. Um, I, I, yeah, I agree. And also like we, we are imposing some limit, even if we are running a Yuki container, we are imposing limitations like at the moment, uh, wrong was it doesn't support uh, TTYs for instance. Um, when even if you're running a, a Yuki container, uh, you still have to go through that gate, uh, where gatekeeping TTY is at the wrong wasi level. Yeah, this is this is a good one to bring up. Uh, Are there other like challenges to using that Yuki wrapper, like stats or like you know C groups V two stats or other things that you end up missing? So I think Yuki is, a, and I'm, I might be wrong, but it, it is conformant to the OCI spec. Yeah, it is. Now it, it passes all the OCI tests. Yeah. Um, it may have different bugs compared to Run C. <laughs> um, yeah, exactly. It, it's gonna ha they, like no matter what, there's going to be some different behavior. Yeah. Um, and it's not desirable. Uh, you would want to choose the runtime that you want executing your containers uh, separate from executing your web WebAssembly modules. And that, yeah. that is reasonable, I think. Uh, it, it, UK does have support for C groups V1, C groups V2, and all, all yada yada. Um, so in, in that sense, it's, it's a really good fun time. Um, th there are some limitations that we're imposing from the Ranwasi side that I guess we could remove at this point. I, I'm not sure uh, that some things are there <laughs> before I join, so I don't have so much context. Um, but yeah, I, th I think that you, you, at the end of the day, probably you want to choose which one you want. You don't want to use like the default that comes with front Yeah. All right. I think that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. I agree. And I think the choice was made, as you say, uh, kind of a hack. Uh, I think the choice is made for expedience to be able to put stuff in people's hands mm -hmm. as opposed to uh, the long process that it will take to change the pot spec. Mm. Oh, definitely. It's like a, a way of getting quickly things working, right? Otherwise, we, I, I don't, it may take many years to, to get something. But um, I, I think it's it's a shortcut, uh, but it's a technical depth. It's something that should be fixed at that different level. And in the meantime, we have this thing. Well, we're still releasing Kubernetes every like three, four months. So it shouldn't be that long to get it done. <laughs> uh, I, I worry about the contention, uh, the contentious nature of changing something that, that has been so, yeah. so long there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> still, it's, so we don't have to take it away. You just add a new, new option. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's just there. <laughs> Four options. I'm joking. <laughs> uh, but I, I was, I was surprised when I first saw that. So when we first started working on the shins, um, and I saw that it was at the pod level. I was I was a little bit surprised uh, by that. Um, I would have expected it at the uh, image level as well. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, yeah. And nobody expected that we will have WebAssembly containers running Kubernetes. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was that was different. <laughs> <laughs> it would help solve some other problems. I, I imagine. To move it I think that's... Outside of WebAssembly, like if mm -hmm. someone wanted to have um, 
uh, like one of the other sandboxing runtimes, but just for one of the containers. Yeah, so I think that's where it starts to get complicated when you start thinking about uh, maybe a Kata container or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, how does how does that when you isolate the Kata container and then you have something uh, else another in there. thing here uh, that's outside of that isolation is that breaking that promise? Would that actually work with uh, Kata containers? Could you could you end up doing the networking uh, across those? Yeah. Uh, that would that would be <laughs> that would be a really interesting advisor. Right? Similar like it's yep. more of a kernel wrapper, but I don't know what would pass through and what wouldn't. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it would be a good thing to uh, you know research and and see where it falls over. I think that something that also needs a good story is how to interface WebAssembly code with native code. So at the moment, if like the, the prime example is if you're going to run uh, a, a web application, uh, you, you, you will want an HTTP server. And you, know, you don't want to implement that it's using WebAssembly. You want your HTTP server to be running natively uh, for a number of reasons. Um, so, but then you still want to use component models. So you, you want your HTTP server to uh, have a, a weak definition that says, I need something that ha can handle and respond to HTTP. And then you want to plug that to a, a WebAssembly module. But doing that at, uh, today means that you have to choose a runtime and you have to uh, write probably Rust code to uh, that pre takes the width definition, generates some Rust code, and then compile against that. And Nginx is written in C. <laughs> so you're not going to be able to do that easily, at least. Or you have to use some time C binding. Or I don't know if you want to use a different runtime. It gets tricky, you know? So if there was some way of running native code, that defines a, a width interface and and you can plug it easily to some WebAssembly code, that would be awesome. Because on, on my head, like again, width is just an API. There's nothing saying that native code can uh, also follow that API to talk to a WebAssembly module. Exactly right. And I think this is part of why we have such a proliferation of runtimes. Um, because each one is adding their own special implementation, mm -hmm. all their host capabilities, right? Mm -hmm. So you look at uh, Spin, Slide, uh, WSS, or WWS. Okay, so that that's 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 linked. Sorry for interrupting. No, <laughs> no, no. That's, uh, that's linked again. Uh, you're calling those runtimes. In in my head, like the runtimes are Wasmer, Wasmatch, Wasm Time. They take a WebAssembly module and they run it. Uh, Things like spin slide, they are not uh, WebAssembly runtimes. They are more like frameworks, a framework for building applications using WebAssembly. Yeah. So um, it's a little bit like the relation to run C and container D, for instance. It's like you have a, a low, lower level uh, container runtime and a higher level container runtime. And like, I think it's somehow equal to you use wasm time, but the wasm worker server, server yeah. is using wasm time. So yeah. you have a lower level runtime actually, which is just about like creating or running the. And uh, again, I think this that... also links to a discussion that we had about the entry points of the containers. Yeah. Uh, that some containers require a WebAssembly uh, file as an entry point, and some containers completely ignore the entry point uh, because, uh, like, it's been doesn't yeah. you can put whatever you want in the entry point, it's going to run. Uh, it's thing, um, or some others require like a folder, which is where they find expect to find certain certain structure. Um, so I think that uh, there's a like for me uh, for, with my definition of runtime, uh, it's clear like you have to take a WebAssembly file, uh, and and the the app frameworks they take some other thing, maybe a toml file for a configuration or a folder where they expect to find certain structure. So the reason why I use runtime to say that is uh, think about what happens when you uh, use WASI NN from WASM time. Mm -hmm. You end up passing WASM time a flag that says, I'm going to use experimental WASI NN. Mm -hmm. And what happens underneath the covers there is that WASM time adds to the linker 
uh, the host definitions for WASI and N. Um, and, and this is this is exactly what uh, Spin and Slight and others uh, do to provide host level functionality. So what you're doing is augmenting that host runtime with uh, extra interfaces that the, the guest can depend upon, right? Um, the, the, the app framework part to me comes in uh, at a slightly higher level opinion of like, okay, hey, how am I gonna tell the runtime what are the things that I need and how to run my thing? Um, and that's, that's where you see like, uh, spin and you start to describe those capabilities within uh, the TOML uh, file where it says, okay, hey, I'm going to al allow these this capability and I'm gonna use this this uh, you know key value store backend or something. Um, that key value store backend uh, is linked into the host and the host provides that up to the guest and the guest uses it. Um, in, in very much the same way that WASM time extends its own host capabilities. Um, that, that doesn't really get us past the whole, like I have an arbitrary, like native, uh, native application like Nginx running, and I want it to go talk to the components um, or, or be able to like execute a component based on like some route uh, that comes in, right? Mm -hmm. um, which would be really, really cool. Uh, I, I, I wonder if there's a way of doing that without actually being invasive in the Nginx project. Um, there is a definition for HTTP handler. Uh, and that, that definition could be used from within the Nginx project to say, okay, here's the interface that I expect. Um, when I grab a component, it better have this interface exported that I can then call um, and invoke uh, in HTTP handler, right? Yeah, yeah. But to be to, to do it without being invasive to Nginx, I I'm not like there would have to be some sort of a you know plugin or a, a, some some extension that that made Nginx aware of how to, how to route, how to call, how to actually, you know, load that web assembly and-, and Yeah, it's... either some plugin or some wrapper around Nginx, like, and at the end of the day, you could, you, you, you wouldn't end up using Nginx as a kind of proxy. You can like, and, 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 right, you can say yeah. like, you know, use this WASM, yeah, as a web so, filter. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, there's a well-defined interface for that that filter. Yeah. And if you implement it, we can call into it. Um, I don't think that that doesn't use the component model, but uh, right. right. Hopefully, at some point it does. That would be cool. So, but uh, Nginx works with PHP, right? So the, there, there's. Uh, so I think that. In, there's a way of telling nginx when when you hit this uh, this endpoint uh, forward that to my PHP engine. Can can we do the same and saying forward that to a given uh, WebAssembly component? Like, of course, it would need some changes from the uh, nginx side. But the, although I think nginx just uses a Nginx domain socket or something like that. So I don't remember how it specifically works with Nginx. As far as I remember, the latest standard I did this was using CGI, basically. So yeah, I think definitively if you have, but, but I see that kind of an intermediary protocol. So basically you are calling to another binary that is listening to that specific interface, which is commonly defined and can be, actually I remember that we have Wagi, for example, yeah. which is another project that that follows that that approach that allows you to plug in um, WebAssembly modules that can talk in the CGI um, language with the, with the servers that can involve those. So I think it's possible, but you are now not tied to the runtime, but tied to the, uh, to that CDI connection between between those. So in the end, I think. Okay, so through. yeah, you're right. It it uses fast G CGI that goes through a, a Unix main socket. Mm -hmm. But uh, so 
I think that a way of I have I have the advantage of having Google next to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think that if you want to add WebAssembly support to Nginx, something we can do is provide a fast CGI adapter that uh, takes fast CGI on one side and holds WebAssembly modules on the other. Uh I, I would I pray that we get away from fast CGI or we get away from uh, I mean no so, so, uh, <laughs> totally yes yes but um if you want to add today support yes, for well yes, assembly uh, in Nginx. Yeah we um, really with that with fast CGI. Uh, <laughs> you, you can do that today, people fall in love and then we can go to Nginx people and say, Hey, let's do this the right way. <laughs> let let's add another which is WebAssembly pass instead of there's an option in, in Nginx which is fast CGI pass. Let's add another one which is WebAssembly pass and let's let's do it correctly. Maybe they already have plans for it. That would be fantastic. We should we should chat with them. That would be really yeah. cool. But yeah. it, it, as a workaround, like the same way we are running native containers with Runwasi using Yuki, uh, we could run WebAssembly modules in Nginx using fast CGI. <laughs> Just, just, just throwing ideas. Yeah, uh, yeah. Th that would be that would be the uh, that would be the first step. The the next one would be really fun to see. Like Nginx is actually loading uh, the the WebAssembly component in its its own memory space and memory isolated sandbox, and then invoking through a uh, component model interface. Um, yeah. That way, it doesn't go across the uh, domain socket, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, we then also get uh, the advantage of being able to spin up on demand and do stuff like that. Swap, swap it out easily. Yeah. Add yeah. components easily. Like that's, that's what Envoy is missing right now. Like to your yeah. point without yeah. using component model, you have to package it all together or find a way to get it in there at runtime. Yeah. I um, remember talking with the, with people working with the, with the Envoy, um, with the Envoy project that one of the complaints or one of the main issues about using WebAssembly as a filtering uh, method is the that the, they do that you have to copy the information in the in the WebAssembly memory. Yeah. So when you are doing that, um, normally it's it's fine. But but in in a server that it's actually filtering constantly all the requests that it gets, and then you are made, made one thousand per second or something like yeah. that. Adding all those milliseconds, yeah, all, all those copies. So they, they were thinking how to solve that, and yeah, it depends on on how on how the um, the server is actually uh, getting the number of requests that the server gets. But yeah, fast CGI could be um, an issue with uh, that approach. I mean, not fast CGI, but having the approach of that you need to actually copy the data to the to the model so it can read the information again, copy back and read right. from the memory. Yeah, I think that but that's also that's also true with the component model because it's share nothing, right? So you're still copying things. I yeah. think there was the concept of multi-memory, but I don't know what's the status of that proposal, mm -hmm. to be honest. Yeah, that's a problem that we have in spades. Um, yeah. It's it is in ML. That's a that's a big problem, right? And that's why we're loading modules by or loading models by name, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So named models because, well, we have memory limitations and because the copy is so expensive. Mm. Um, you don't want to have to GC the same data twice. Yeah. Like, yep. you, you really just want to map that into the, the module's memory, uh, linear memory, and then and just execute on it as opposed to a, a, a copy. Mm. Um, yeah. Isn't that expensive for a, a, a web endpoint for an HTTP endpoint? I would have thought that there's not that much traffic going. Like for a, for a machine learning model, yes, there's like gigabytes of training data and things like that. But uh, for an endpoint where you just have an HTTP request or a response that you have to copy from one side to the other, I would have thought that's not very expensive. Uh, not for one, but probably yeah. for thousands. Like I, I think it's more the- Okay, yeah, side. it might be expensive okay. for a thousand, but it, it's much more expensive the computation you're doing on that. like. Like there's a fire next to us, and we are trying to extinguish the the fire in the, in a little match, you know. <laughs> <clears throat>
be, be, being the German here in the round, I guess we that we need to uh, finish this this uh, conversation, this talk because like no, no, you no, know no. it's a starting in yeah, 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 one <laughs> <laughs> All right. So yeah. uh, this was a uh, wonderful discussion. Yeah. Uh, let's try to, in, in future for Meta, let's try to get a little bit more on the agenda. If not, um, then let's uh, let's try to pull in some projects and mm. see yeah. who's interested within the CNCF community to talk about their mm. project and possibly where uh when somebody could benefit that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we just discussed yesterday to a couple of yeah. people uh, with, with ideas of things that could be added to the added agenda. Um, but I guess like maybe it was a little bit too early for today. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I think we can screw it off. Bye. Uh, right. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Enjoy the conference. Have, have fun you. Cheers, y'all. Bye. <laughs> well, thanks for inviting me to join.